uh, Angela, I've seen previous interviews and I've, with the police, and uh, one of our colleagues talked to you once upon a time. Uh, you're very upfront. Very much. About talking about this killing. Right. You, you murdered this man. Yes. You tortured him. Of course. There is no ambiguity and there is nothing you want to... S yeah, in court today you said uh, you're not here to pretend to be remorseful. Of course not. Why would I do that? Are you remorseful? Not at all. Why? Why would I be? Well, I, wh why, why did this man deserve to die? You, you, you claimed he was a snitch. Well, what proof do you have of that? He told me he was a snitch. He told you. On many occasions. But that really doesn't matter. Why did you guys want to kill me? Phoenix wanted to kill me. What's the difference? Everybody has a reason to kill. My reason might not be good to you, but your reason wasn't good to me. So. Um, the incident, can you tell me anything about what happened during those three days while you were... At what do you mean? You know, uh, it's I like took him to my house, walked him down the street. I don't know why the media acts like the motherfucker couldn't walk. He walked very well. Walked him upstairs, kicked his ass, and killed him. And, and again, you, the, your belief is that he was a snitch because he right. told you... Uh, you claimed that uh, that other people had been killed in that same part. You had killed other people. Have you killed other no, people? No, I've never killed anyone else. So that was something, just talk. Right. Uh, how do you feel about uh, spending the rest of your life in prison? You know, I got a lot of family in prison, and uh, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I got many sisters in prison. I can't wait to see them. It's really not that much of a punishment to be sentenced to spend my life with my family. Uh, and you, you, you don't want to talk about your, your past, but your lawyer said that, you know what, they, in, in sentencing you, the judge should bear in mind that you've had a really, you had a really right. tough life. I started being hospitalized at 10 years old. I have a mental history from 10 years old until yeah. present, so, yeah. When you say mental history, I mean... Do, do you care that anyone feels sorry for you? Do you want anybody? Feel sorry for me. Yeah. Do you, should, should the people who are watching this say because she had a bad childhood? Of course not. Because she had as mental illness? Of course not, no. That we should feel some sympathy for no. you? No. You would not have that? I want no sympathy, no. What, then, then do you care what anybody thinks about no. Angela Simpson and what no. you have done? No, I don't. It's, a, again, your candor... At, I've interviewed people who have committed murders before, and usually they sort of prevaricate or they uh, this or that. You're about as direct as it gets. Right. Why is that? It's only fair. I expect you to be the same way. Okay. Uh, do you think that it was fair today? It was justice in that courtroom? No, I don't. Why? I should have gotten the death penalty. Do you, did you want the death penalty? No, no. I prefer to spend my life with my sisters, but I, yeah, I do believe that would have been justice. So you deserve death penalty, but you're glad that you got what you got right. because you. Right. Right. Uh, when you say your sisters, you're talking about women you know in prison. Right. Okay. And is, uh, have you found that uh, uh, that there is some bonding and that you have made friends here that uh, that will be of some comfort to you when you're in Most prison? Most definitely, yes. Most definitely, yes. Yeah. What has the experience been like here uh, in this facility? Horrible. Really? Yes, it's terrible. Jail is awful. They don't, um, they have no, well, they, they have no compassion. They don't give us the things we need here. Will be, will prison to you, to the end, your understanding? I have certainly hope so, yes. Yeah. Have you done time in prison? No. So you're hoping that it will be a better existence. Yes, for you, yeah? definitely. You're a young woman, 36 years old. You could be there a long time. Right. Right. But your belief is that you deserve the death penalty. Definitely. Well, I believe God. That's what God says. Unless God is wrong, which I doubt. So. And where would God would has told you that, or you just believe that? I believe I that. I an eye. Right. Right. I expected to die for this. Uh, to, what can you? What, what insights can you give us to to you? Uh, what would you have the anyone who may hear this interview know about you? There's really nothing. People are going to believe what they want to believe. Judge the way they want to judge, just like I do. So. Yeah. So be it. 
What, why did you feel like you were in a position to be the judge and jury in, in Terry Neely's life? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm really not trying to be to, to get you right. angry, but I just I want to see. You, you're very, you say I killed this guy. He deserved right. to die. Blah blah blah. I mean, it's pretty. It's there. You're up right. front. Uh, I want to know uh, if if uh, you have any concerns about what you know what what put you in that position to do that to them. It was just too much. The things he talked about. It was just. It was too much. Do you believe him? I mean, lots of people go around well, claiming I'm a snitch or make themselves... <laughs> really, you don't say. Well, I, I think they, they talk about... <laughs> law, they, I've got, uh, I, I know people come to me, I've got associations with law enforcement. Uh, you know, I, I've got this, I'm, I'm, if I'm a friend with this... Do person. you happen to have a list of those people? They name drop, well, maybe in the circle, but you right. know what I'm saying. Right. People say lots of things to make themselves sort of look... Well, he picked the wrong nigger to say that to if he wanted to brag about putting so many people in prison, uh, you pick the wrong person. Yeah, that's what, that's what did it to him. That's, what, that's why you... What, the bragging? The bragging oh, yeah. about putting people in prison. Right. People you knew? No. No, but I he, don't know any of them. Okay. Do you believe him? Do you think he really was a snitch? <laughs> Oops, if he wasn't. Yes, I, I believe he was. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, uh, do you have family? I do. Uh, from an adoptive family or I have four children you have four children I do have four children where are they El Mirage what is uh, how are they doing uh, and uh, how is it for you to be separated from them I, I don't want to talk about my children I can't do that uh, is there is there a message for what is there a bottom line or a lesson to be learned from the story of Angela Simpson? There's a bottom line to everything. But what would, what is the bottom line to I, this story? Whatever people want it to be. If I it, it doesn't what matter do what I say. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, in, insights uh, that you you don't regret killing this guy. I don't regret killing him. No. I regret the fact that my co-defendants found it necessary to uh, divulge so much information to the detectives. I regret that. They were people I really cared about. And uh, I regret that they were near me or around me at any point. And then helped prosecutors. Help the prosecution, correct. You were and they those people. Definitely, because they didn't know. They weren't actually with me during any of my crimes. So for them to say that they were to try to get lesser sentences was a little heartbreaking for me. So friends of yours lied to prosecutors and lied to police. Correct. Dropped the dime on you. Correct. They snitched on you. Correct. If you could, would you do to them what uh, you did no, to Terry? No, I would not. Because you would still have some relationship with them? or Well, no, but they were, I had uh, claimed a bond with them at one point, so I, I wouldn't be able to avenge that. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you act completely alone in that? Yes, part? definitely. So nobody else helped? No. Totally alone. Uh, help me understand. Uh, for three, you know, I, I know uh, the crimes of passion or something, and you know, in, in the heat of the moment, uh, but to spend three days driving nails into a guy's head and pulling his teeth out. Right. Why? found it necessary. Did you find it pleasurable or exciting or was there was this just, just a necessary? Necessary. Right. So this was more like a business like uh, proposition. You were doing something that you felt need a job that needed to be done. Right. Really? Right. And whatever came into your head, I'm going to drive a nail into his head. Or was this just was uh, a, a symptom of what was at hand in that apartment? Right. Yeah. Right. Any, uh, you, your moment. I, I'd like to, because we've got to get run back, and right. I, I, I want to get what you say on television. And we again, I'm grateful that you would be willing to talk to us, and I, I wish you the best under these Thank circumstances. You. What, what would you have the world know? You're a fascinating. You're sort of an interesting character. 
because you know, first of all, women generally don't commit crimes this heinous. Right. Uh, you know, this is usually the domain of men. That's unfortunate. <laughs> you think more women? Oh yeah, equal opportunity, definitely. And I know you're being sort of a smart aleck to Slightly me. sarcastic. But, yeah. uh, but seriously, I, I mean, in, in some ways, uh, I've been covering murder and mayhem and covered serial killers to petty shoot 'em ups And uh, you don't meet many women who commit the kind of uh, calculated, long-term murder that you committed with this guy. Uh, and you don't meet many people who are willing to say, I did it, and you know what? Deal with it. Right. The way it should be, in my opinion. Are you? But you seem so. You, you, you seem like you're sort of just. I, I, I'm sort of almost self-righteous about. I, I did this, and I did. Do you think you did the right thing of by course. killing this guy? Definitely. But other than shooting his mouth off, what else did he do? That you know of? That's not. That's what he. That's what he got done for. Shoot. He's white trash. Somebody had to take it out. That's it. Was there a racial component to it? Oh, there's always a racial component. Okay. And what do you mean by that? I'm not going to elaborate on that at all. Okay. But, <laughs> but the, the fact that you're, you're uh, a black woman and he's a white guy, that factored into your killing him? Yeah. I wouldn't kill another black individual. Okay. Would you, if you had that moment to live over again? I'd have kept him alive a week. But you would have still tortured him and killed him. Oh, I'd have tortured him for a week, yeah, instead of three days, definitely. So your only regret is that the torture didn't go on any longer. Right, and I regret not killing my other victim. I should have killed him, too. I just didn't have time. I had to go somewhere. And so. tell me who that other victim was. Joseph Van Tress for the armed robbery. Yeah. I should have killed him, but I had to go. Will you kill again? If the opportunity arises, I hope so. Okay, let's. We're done. Are you done? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Rachel. Good shit, dude. That's gonna be crazy, isn't it? <laughs> That's gonna be wicked. Make it look good, please. Oh, you're, you're gonna put this on too? That look like either way. Let's put the ending on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Best wishes to you and uh, right. Right. ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Very real. I can't. I can, honestly can't. Tell me again. This guy is incorrigible. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> in, I'm incorrigible. All right, not you. He's incorrigible. We're both incorrigible. Right. Best wishes right, to you. Right, right. Thank you. Let me chat a card with him. Um, I have a other name. All right. Well. You know, I was just wondering how you're going to be. You know, at 9:30 tomorrow morning. Are you prepared? I'm prepared. I'm all right. I'm all right with it. And how? I'm all right with it, but like I said, remember, tell, let them know that I know that the cops knew who I was after Richard Mallory died. I left prints everywhere, and they covered it up. And let me kill the rest of those guys to turn me into a serial killer. I know they did because I was no professional serial killer or anything, or murderer, or whatever you want to call it, you know. It wasn't special at so what I was doing. Eileen, how... I did how, some sloppy work, you know, and I left How have you prepared yourself for tomorrow morning? How, I'm all right with it. Hey, I'm ready to go. Hey, I was tortured at BCI. They had, they had the intercom on in the room, and they kept lying that it wasn't on, and they were using sonic pressure on my head since 1997. Sonic and pressure. every time I was trying to write something, I, they, and I, I think they had some kind of eye in the cell, I'm not sure, but every time I started writing something, it went up higher. So I'm thinking that probably had the TV rigged. The TV or the mirror or something was rigged. They got a huge satellite on the compound. After they put the huge satellite on the compound, it could have been either rigged to the TV set or the mirror or something, because the electrician, when he put the mirror on the wall, he said, doesn't that look like a computer? the back of it, and they stuck it to the wall. And do you think, what, did that affect your mind, do you think? Huh? Did that affect your mind in some way, the sonic? It was crushing my head, and they were using sonic pressure continually. 
Now, when I had three meetings with Miss Villacorta on it, every meeting I had, she increased the pressure of the volume of the calm, increased the harassment on the floor, increased the uh, trays being inedible, just increased every bit of my complaints and trashed all grievances. They're trying to make it look like I was crazy at all times, rig up the room with torture. If I said anything about their whole, I think their whole plan was to try to make it look like I was totally crazy. And so nobody would believe anything I had to say about anything. And then drive me there if they could. I suffered so bad. I was really struggling to survive. Had a lot of trays that were attempted murder and everything. I had to wash all my food off. And then one day I didn't wash my food off and I was sick for three weeks, almost died. But you're okay now. I'm okay, I'm okay. God is gonna be there. Jesus Christ is gonna be there, all the angels and everything. And you know, whatever, whatever's on the beyond, I think it's gonna be more like Star Trek beaming me up into a space vehicle, man. Then I move on, recolonize to another planet or whatever. But it's whatever's the beyond, I know it's gonna be good because I didn't do anything as wrong as they said. I did the right thing. And I saved a lot of people's butts from getting hurt and raped and killed too. So are you saying that you killed in self-defense or in, in cold blood? What do you, what do you, because you, you've changed your story. I'm just trying to- What are you talking about? Change story on what? No, about whether it was self-defense or not. I'm not gonna say, you know, I'm not gonna get in a depth about my cases, Nick. I'm on my way to the chamber, nothing's stopping it. You can believe it or you don't have to believe it. That's up to you, man. Put a big question mark on your film. What more is there to say about the cops? <laughs> what, what more do you want to say about the cops? A lot of stuff. Did you know that they were surveilling me before I killed? And then I knew it? And that it was covered up? Did you know there was helicopters dropping down from the sky? Deputy Sheriff with decoys picking me up four or five months before my arrest? It was covered up? But nonetheless, nobody ever asked me these the questions. Whether the cops were following you or not, Eileen. Oh, whether the cops were following me or okay. not, Eileen. Okay, what? Let's say, let's say the cops were following you. Yeah. Let's say they were following uh -huh. you and they did everything that you're, you're saying they did. Uh huh. Nonetheless, yeah. you killed seven men. Yes, yeah, sure you did. And I'm asking you, what got you to kill the seven men? And I'm men? telling you because the cops let me keep killing them, Nick. Don't yeah, you not, get it? Not everybody is killing seven people. So there must have been something in you that was getting you to Oh, do you that. are lost, Nick. So I was a hitchhiking hooker. Right. Running into trouble. I shoot, shoot the guy if I ran into trouble. Physical trouble. The cops knew it. When the physical trouble came along, let, him, let her clean the streets. And but, then we'll pull her in. But That's how come why. there was so much physical trouble? In just, it, because it was all in one year. Seven people in one oh, year. Oh, well. Oh, well. But why not say now? Because I'm out of retaliation for taking my life like this and getting rich off it all these years in, in total pathological lying. Yeah, thanks a lot. I lost my fucking life because of it. Couldn't even get a fair trial. Couldn't even get a fair investigation or nothing. Couldn't even have my appeals right. You sabotaged my ass society and the cops and the system, a raped woman got executed it was used for books and movies and shit ladder climbs the re-election everything else i got a big finger in all your faces thanks a lot you're inhuman you're an inhumane bunch of fucking living bastards and bitches and you're going to get your asses nuked in the end and pretty soon it's coming 2019 a rock's supposed to hit you anyhow you're all going to get nuked you don't take fucking human life like this and just sabotage and rip it apart like jesus on the cross and say thanks a lot for all the fucking money I made off of you. And not care about a human being and the truth being told. Now I know what Jesus was going through. They've been trying to tell the truth. And I keep getting it stepped on. Concerned about if I was raped, if I... I'm not giving you book and movie info. I'm giving you info for investigations and stuff. And that's it. We're going to have to cut this interview, Nick. I'm not going to go into any more detail. I'm leaving. I'm glad. Thanks a lot, Society, for railroading my ass. Okay, let's go. It was really pretty incredible that I leave through the, the type of abuse that you had to suffer as a kid. You mean sexual abuse? 
if that's what happened? That definitely did happen to me. That's why I know exactly how I would have grew up. I told my mother what happened to me. And the only thing she said was, it's over with, so what the you want me to do about it? What do you mean what I want you to do? You get what I'm saying? So all I could do is go back and sit in my room and just sit there and look stupid. I'm a kid, and I'm just telling you what happened to me. You didn't do about it. And plus, I still had to see the person coming in and out of my house. You're still friends with that person. So do you believe that the, the violent person you went on to become is a, you were a product of your own childhood? I mean, everybody have choices, so I can't just blame all that on my mom because I was still an adult. Maybe I should have tried hard to get over that. But anybody who knows me, that touching the kids, the molesters, that no, no. If that's one thing I definitely would have killed over, it would have always been that. It's like I grew up every man, you, I even tried to talk to my mom when I got in my mid-20s. She had strokes and things like that. And I'm like, Mom, she could barely talk. You could barely talk. Because she had so many strokes. And I'm telling you what my problem was always with you. The hitting and all that. I just asked you to do something. The person lives around the corner on This particular time, it was just a woman named She lived around the corner. She want to walk around like she big and bad all day. My mama, you, you, you big and bad. Everybody's scared of you. But when I come to you with some real and I tell you what happened to me, you didn't walk your around that corner and do to that woman like a coward. So no. No. And this is why I say my kids knew better because I've always told them everything that happened to me. I told them why? Because I don't understand why it took me so long to tell my mom when I was a kid. You never talked to me about like this, but when I did come to you, you didn't do so I always made sure I told my kids this. I told them what happened to me, how it happened to me, how it made me feel in detail. And I say, if anybody ever touches y'all, you better tell me. They knew. I always talked to my kids about that, that touching from anybody. So they definitely knew. And this is the part that really gets me. I used to tell her, rape is the worst thing you can do. Just make it. I tell her all the time. They used to make me feel like I was nothing. It made me feel like I wasn't. You turn around and you do that to my son, you knew exactly what she was doing to him. She knew exactly what the fuck she was doing to him. So yes, yeah, she, man, I don't care what anybody thinks. She had to go, period. So I damn sure wasn't about to let me grow up mad as hell all the damn time. Can't trust nobody. When it was just as simple as, you're my mother, do something. Didn't call the police, didn't do just said, it's over with now. What the f you want me to do about it? That's my response. So yeah, that's the problem. And this is what can happen to a kid. When like that goes. That wasn't happening to my son, period. So when I say he got closure, he got it. I know exactly what he was feeling. Even when my son was talking to me about some of the stuff, he would go like this to his face. He was like, Mom, and it felt so nasty. And that, that right there, I knew exactly what he was doing. I knew how he was feeling because that's how I used to feel. When he, when he did that, I knew it. It ain't no amount of talking. It was, no. So when you tell me she's a 13-year-old child, okay. Some of the most heinous crimes in this world has been by kids. So I, I don't want to hear that. That's my family. I don't give a damn what America thinks. But I also want to tell America they can kiss my ass. Don't throw no stones, because they got a whole lot coming their way too. They just feel more comfortable for them to be able to say, well, my sin is not as bad as yours. At least I didn't kill my kids. F that in God's eyes, we all f down here. That's period. Okay. But I love and I love and I'm always love him. That's my son. Why did you take the decision to pile the bodies on top of each other in a freezer? What do you mean? Why did you do that? Well, I only had one deep freezer. I mean, take the decision to pile the bodies on top of each other. Where was she gonna go? How did you conceivably sleep at night? I slept well. Of course, at first I cried. It was 
up because I had to let go of all of that. I'm doing my best, Michelle, to listen to what you're saying. However, I, I need to know that you also accept that you had a number of other options open to you other than the extreme violence with which you decided to act. What do you mean accept it? You had a number of other options. There were no other options. I, I'm not playing crazy. I wasn't in depression, none of that. It's no excuse for rape, period. According to police reports, you ordered your eldest daughter uh, to, to, to physically lift the body of, of, of one of your children. No, I didn't tell her to lift the body. Can you imagine? Talking about no, we're talking, you want to talk about your surviving body. children though, Michelle? Uh, you didn't ever consider turning yourself in? If my son told me that he did not want me to go after what happened with statement, after I killed son, do you really think I was about to turn myself in because of her? Hell no. 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 And you feel no remorse for that? I would kill him again. Storm, and she's right-handed. And I made the comment to the police department there that night. Uh, it looks to me like Diane did it because the children have been shot in the chest and Diane has only been shot in the arm. And I, I says, it really looks like she did it. Uh, that's, uh, that really is the thing that spurred them to go and check, uh, to do the Q-tips, run the Q-tips around her finger to check for the powder residue and to also spray her hands to see if she held a gun. So it was a good thing that I expressed that. And I'm a very open person. If I, if I think that uh, somebody did something, I'm not about to hesitate to say they didn't. You know, I'll, I'll tell them that I think they did. And I'd say the same thing again if I believed it. I've had plenty of opportunity to follow, and, and that's one of the main reasons, I guess, uh, for peace of mind. I've, I've followed through, and I know that my daughter didn't do it. I have been through that night so many times. I've even been through it with my psychologist. It's very hard. It's very tearful. There are a lot of memories that, um, I don't know. A lot of people, when something traumatic happens to them, they suppress it immediately. I kept those memories because I knew that I was the only person that was going to be able to tell them what happened when we got to the hospital. And when I got there, the first thing I said was, call the doctor. Second thing was the blood type. Third thing was, call the cops because they've got to, they've got to find him. And so I had to remember as much as I could remember. When this man shot my daughter, my first reaction was to snap back to my childhood, to the pain that had happened to me back then, my marriage my entrapment by society. This man was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He had more power because he had a gun. He was in control and I was not. And I had, there was nothing I could do. And I stood there and I looked at Christy reaching and the blood that just kept gushing out of her mouth. And, and I, what do you do? Mm. You just stand there trapped. And then, and then the gun kept firing and firing and firing. And it, it, it made, it was monotonous. It just kept going. It was like a slow motion picture. And then he swung around towards me, and I, and this is something that I did not recall when I was explaining to the cops because there, it, was, it wasn't like a movie when I was telling them. I was telling them what happened, the important details. He shot my kids. I pushed him. I ran. And when he swung around, he was pointing when he swung around, it hit the tips of my fingers. The gun hit the tips of my fingers. Mm -hmm. And that snapped me. And I went, Wait a minute. I'm not trapped by society. I don't care if he is bigger. If I stand here and I say, yeah, here, take the keys. I mean, there's nothing I can do. You win because you have the gun. My kids are going to die. And I'm not going to let my kids die. And so instead of giving him the keys, I feigned throwing the keys. He did not take time to point the gun and shoot me, obviously, because he would have shot me the same way he did the kids. When he was swinging in the direction of the keys, firing the gun, he hit my arm. Everybody says, you sure were lucky. Well, I don't feel very lucky. I couldn't tie my damn shoes for about two months. It is very painful. It is still painful. I have a steel plate on my arm. I will for a year and a half. The, the scar is going to be there forever. I'm going to remember that night for the rest of my life, whether I want to or not. I don't think I was very lucky. I think my kids were lucky. If I had been shot the way they were, we all would have died, except what, maybe Danny. What haunts you the most about that night? What do I see most is blood coming out of Christy's mouth, because that's what I see. 
Um, I, I can't see Danny, and I can't see Cher. Sherry was laying on the floor, and driving to the hospital, I don't know the sounds that were made at the initial shooting, because I was on the outside, and all I could hear, I, ca I can't hear anything but gunshots. And I can, I can see things, you know, I, that's it. Driving to the hospital, I can smell blood. I can not hear Cheryl. Cheryl's not making a sound. Danny is just crying real, real soft. So, so that sound stays in my mind, and the fact that Christy's choking, it just, and then I'm yelling at her, I'm screaming at her to, to roll over on her face, because I was trying to keep her from choking on her blood, and it just didn't dawn on me that she was shot in the chest and that the blood was coming from her chest, not going down into her chest. Yeah. Down says her childhood and marriage flashed before her the night of the murder. Diane is the oldest of four Fredrickson children, and she says her childhood is a great source of pain in her life. How did your childhood affect you? Everything that happens to you as a child contributes to how you turn out as an adult. Um, to be honest, it made me a better person because I know all the mistakes. I know not what not to do to my kids. I know what to avoid. Uh, one thing is to not be married. <laughs> and that may seem very harsh, but I honestly don't believe that children need fathers. And they're nice to have around sometimes when they can do things to help you, but when they are mentally abusive, when they are harsh, and the way my ex-husband was, they're more a deterrent to the children than a help. And unless you can find a good father, there is no need for them. <laughs> Did your childhood affect your attitude toward men? That has a lot to do with it. That had a lot to do with it for many, many, many years. I hated men with a passion. But uh, yeah, I hated men for a long time. That's why I met Steve. That's why I married Steve, because Steve did not seem to be that way. Um, Steve was always on his best behavior. He does, he does the thing that most people do when they're dating, and that's put their best foot forward. Mm -hmm. They're every, you're nice, they're punctual, they're everything they're supposed to be. And then you marry them, and it's, hey, Diane, can you let yourself in? I have to run down and look at a car. <laughs> yeah. That's what yeah. he did on our wedding day. And, well, actually, I found it out the day I got married, and then within the next two months after that, I found out that Steve was exactly like my father. But it took me two years, three years, to finally say, I can't take it anymore. He really, really is. He's not going to change. I am a person that believes that everybody's going to change the, for the better, given the right circumstances. If you be a good wife, if you don't mm. nag, if you love them, if you're always there when they need them, if the food's always ready, if the house is always clean, they're going to change. He didn't change. And that's why, even though we were married for eight years, only three of it was not tolerable. It wasn't tolerable, but that was the only three that I tried. After that, I quit because I didn't want to be married anymore. Diane says her marriage with Steve Downs deteriorated when friction arose over an unexpected pregnancy. Okay, after I had Christy and after I had Cheryl, Steve had a vasectomy. It didn't work. And he never went back to get checked to see if it worked. He just figured, doctors know what they're doing. It must have worked. So after, I think it's, uh, you're supposed to wait 10 weeks, be on some kind of contraceptive for 10 weeks, and then you're safe. And then you check. But you're then... supposed to check, yeah. yeah. He never went back because he was just too busy, and the doctor probably knew what he was doing. Well, I got pregnant, and I knew that I wasn't messing around with anybody, and that if I was pregnant, because I know what being pregnant feels like, I know how I got that way. And I told him about it, and he gave me heck. Oh, he so was is just Danny furious. or is Danny not? That was the child that I aborted. Steve okay. put me through hell with that one, yeah. and I had an abortion. Cheryl was colicky. Steve was bitching. We find, I made Steve go back to the doctor or, or shut up. Don't accuse me until you know. The doctor said, yeah, you are fertile. I guess I goofed up. <laughs> Come on in, and we'll go ahead and do it again. Well, I was pregnant. So I was 20 years old, had two kids. Cheryl was colicky. My husband was a bastard. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I had an abortion. And it was something that did not bother me for two years. And then I was at a fair in Arizona. I walked past a Right to Life booth. And they told me at the time that I aborted that I was six weeks. And I figured six weeks, that is a condition. You are not pregnant. That is a condition. It's a, a little ball of slime, you know. No big deal. It's a fetus is slime, I figured. I saw a six-week fetus. That baby had arms, legs, fingers, toes, a head, eyes. That was a baby. It was a human being, and I killed it. 
And I felt so horrible about it that I had killed somebody like that. I, I didn't kill it myself, but I, I hired a doctor to do it. Yeah. And so I asked my husband to have his vasectomy changed, reversed. He refused. I asked him for a year. He kept saying no. I said, fine, I will find a suitable donor. I watched people I worked with. I picked somebody that was attractive, that was healthy, that was not abusive of drugs and alcohol and such. Was strong, you know, bone structure, the whole bit, a good specimen. It was really clinical. It was really terrible. And <clears throat> I seduced him. And I know my cycle. And it only took once. And I got pregnant. I went home. And about a week later, I told Steve I was pregnant. And he goes, how do you know? And I says, well, I know my cycle. I know I'm pregnant. And he was really upset. For that whole nine months, he put me through hell every day, every night. It was terrible. Just railed on me constantly, told me to get an abortion, the whole bit. <clears throat> and then after the baby was born, he told me, if you have a girl baby, I might let you stay around. But if you have a boy, I'm kicking you both out on your butts, and you're going to take those two with you also, because how do I know they're mine? That kind of attitude. Well, I lived with that for nine months. Thing. Well, when Danny was born, Steve, because, okay, the reason it had to be a girl was because Christy was supposed to be a boy. I was so cruel and mean I had a girl, and Steve just couldn't stand it. Got one more chance, Diane. Cheryl better be a boy. Well, Cheryl turned out being a girl. He came into the recovery room. He goes, well, where is he? I said, he's a she. He says, how could you do that? You know, we're not having any more kids. Crazy. Flipped out. So if I was going to have another one, I better darn sure have a girl. Well, when Danny was born, he was a boy, and my first thought was, I'm dead, he's dead, what's he going to do to that baby? And then I didn't care. I mean, that was my baby. That was supposedly the baby that was going to replace the one that I had boarded. And as soon as I looked at Danny, I said, you can't. That's, that's a boy baby. That's, and I just knew that the baby I had aborted was a girl. I'd named her Carrie and everything. It's just a t different human being altogether, you know. Mm. A whole lot of emotion on that delivery table. And Steve standing there right beside me looking at me like, you witch. How could you do this? You're out, you know. And Dr. George hand, mm. handed Daniel to Steve. And from that point on, Steve spent the rest of the, the past four years trying to prove to people that he was not biased and not prejudiced, thereby becoming biased and prejudiced. We've talked to Steve Downs in the past about some of these events. We attempted to contact him again, but his attorney wouldn't allow him to comment because of the trial. Downs knew a lengthy murder trial would make her private life public territory. She's very frank about being a surrogate mother. She ran a surrogate program in Arizona and gave birth to another couple's child. Diane lost visitation rights to her own two surviving children after the murder. She was found guilty of contempt of court for seeing them in a secret visit set up by her ex-husband, Steve. Police found out about the visit in a letter Downs wrote to her former boyfriend, Robert Knickerbocker, known as Nick, in Arizona. You fought for Steve to get custody of the kids, and then you wrote a letter to your former boyfriend telling him that Steve was an unfit father for your children. A lot of people won't understand that, Diane. But Steve is different than most people. He can... Steve pointed an empty gun at my head at one time and pulled the trigger. Do you know why? He wanted me to marry him. That is crazy! CSD, I believe, is very careful in picking out the people that care for a child that they think has been abused. And right now, they believe that Christy has been one of the most abused children in the world. Granted, she was shot, but before that, she was never abused. But they believe that that's probably true. And so they're going to put Christy in a very, very good place. And so I know that Christy's in a good home. Yeah. And so I just decided that it was better that Christy be in a safe, in a, sta a mentally stable environment rather than to be with Steve. And if I had walked up to Susan Staffel and said, please don't let them go to Arizona, or if I had called Furtick and asked the same thing, they would have sent the kids, or they would, granted, they could not send the kids. They make suggestions to the court as to what happens to the kids. And they would have suggested to the court that the kids go, merely because I don't want them to. That means Steve and I had a falling out. What better place could they be safe? Not realizing that they aren't safe from Steve, even, and emotionally. And so I couldn't just count on them to cooperate with me. They haven't so far. I couldn't expect them to now. 
And so I had to find another way to tell them. And I know that my ex-boyfriend was a fink. He was taping for the cops. He admitted that he was everything, every conversation that I had with him on the phone was taped and sent immediately to the DA's office. And I knew that that letter, if I sent it to him and he read it, would in fact get to the DA's office. And, but all the other letters that I'd been sending as of late were being returned. And mm -hmm. so I knew that I had to do something to make that letter so enticing that he would open it. Down says she felt trapped in her marriage with Steve and hoped a divorce would solve their problems. Was there ever a time when, during that, that you thought about taking your own life and oh, yeah. went into the bathroom with the gun and yeah. shot it? Yeah. So that is indeed... That is true. Only, no, it, it, it's not... Uh, that's a long one, too. It takes many, many years of being mentally harassed, pushed into a corner. You can't go anywhere. You're trapped. It comes, it, it even stems from my childhood of being trapped. You know that you can't go away. You can't go someplace else. There's no place to escape to because they'll take, they'll find you. They'll bring you back. Yeah. You'll be punished somehow. Steve was the same type of person. He was the kind of person that, at nighttime especially, was his best time for fighting. And he would just rail on me, just fight and fight and fight, and I, there was no way to escape, no way at all. Well, after I got my divorce, I figured I was free of that, and I wasn't. Steve would still come to my house and still do the same thing, and this was two years after our divorce, and he came to my house, and he, I had taken a gun. He had a handgun. It was the handgun that he had put to my head, unloaded and fired, and I took it from him. I swiped it from him, and I hid it in my house, and... It was in my bedroom, he was doing it again, and he was getting very, very physical. Steve had, ne had just beat me up two weeks before that, beat me up terribly. I, there was blood all over the place. The, the sheriff's department came out and made a report on it, and my nose was all bruised, my face was bruised, my chest was bruised, he had choked me. It was, I was terrified of him, he had never done that before. And for all I knew, this was two weeks later, he was gonna do it again. And I ran in the bathroom, and well, I ran in the bedroom and slammed the door, and he, was coming through the door anyway, so I grabbed the gun and I ran in the bathroom and locked the door. And my first thought was, I'll never escape from him. I will never, ever get away. I divorced him and that is, isn't even getting away from him. It doesn't matter what I do. I'll never get away from the insanity except just to be oblivious to it. And I considered shooting myself, but it was a 22 handgun. And Steve had said, you can't kill anybody with a 22. Surprise. Mm -hmm. There's no way you could kill somebody. You would hurt them badly. And then I thought, besides, my kids need me. I can't die. Then I thought, maybe I should kill him. And then I said, same gun, same situation. I would hurt him. He would be furious. Then I'm really going to be in trouble. And so I said, what do I do? How do I tell him I'm serious? The gun How went do off? I get, yes, I fired it to scare the hell out of him. Hmm. I wanted him to know that I was serious enough that if he kept this up, if he kept doing what he was doing to my mind, someday perhaps that would be pointed at a person. Not now, but someday. And he just, I fired the gun, he went, oh my God, and he broke the door down. And I sat there and I handed him the gun and I said, now do you believe me? And he took the gun and he said, yeah, and he left. According to police reports, Steve Downs and Robert Knickerbocker told authorities Diane left Arizona with that gun in the trunk of her car. The gun hasn't been seen since. Downs kept a diary. It was a form of solace for her. Her journal entries took the form of unmailed letters to Robert Knickerbocker. She wrote of her love for him and the day-to-day -day events that happened before the murder. But May 19th, the night of the shootings, is blank except for the date sketched at the top. I don't even cry in front of my family. And I can go to my room and I can write in this diary, this record book, uh, some of my fears. And, and it's really even sketchy. I don't write in a lot of detail. There are days when I'm overwhelmed with, with emotion and the book will be rather emotional, but, but very few days. It's just sitting in front of the book and, and writing down little sentences and then being able to cry over it and, and feel emotionally everything that, that I don't physically write down. And it's a very good release. It's, uh, it's therapy in a way. It's also a way of keeping a record because in the beginning so many things were said to me that were denied later.
Oh, it's so sad. Have you ever thought of the fact that your writing these things could be used against you or in your favor at any future time? No, I didn't because I never thought the book would be made public. Police seized that diary as evidence in the case. Downs is now expecting another child. She says her pregnancy takes away the feelings of loneliness in prison. I got pregnant because I miss Christy and I miss Danny and I miss Cheryl so much. I'm never going to see Cheryl on earth again. And I just, you can't replace children, but you can replace the effect that they give you. And they give me love, they give me satisfaction, they give me stability, they give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy. And, and that's gone, they took it from me. But children are so easy to conceive. Obviously, everyone is curious who the father is, and I know you probably don't want to talk about that. Does the father know who he is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's why I won't talk about it, because he feels as privately about this child as I do. What would you do, given this current situation, if they said, they took, if they took away your kids, mm -hmm. and then they went one step further and said, we think you're an unfit mother. We're going to take away this one? I don't know how they're going to do it. <laughs> what if the, I, I'd like to see them try to take this baby from me, and... <laughs> How? How could they do it? They're going to have to wait a long time to do it. Hopefully this thing will be cleared up by then. I don't know that they could do this, take it away after it's born. I don't know. I've never even talked to my attorney about it because it seems so... Let's put it the way the DA says. It's laughable. Down says her parents were shocked when they found out she was pregnant again. My parents are the kind of people that wish you would do everything by the book in the order that it's pre-written. You get married before you have a baby. <laughs> and being married is not, and never has been, I take it back, when I was young, when I was 16, 17, 18, being married was the most important thing in the world to me. And I think it's because I was raised that way. Most girls are. Yeah. But since that time, since my divorce, being married has been an iffy thing. I can do it if I want. I don't have to if I don't want it. And it's never been uppermost in my mind. My children are. My children always have been. And having children is, I think being a mother is the most wonderful job that, that any woman could perform. I die every day. When I go to bed, I cry at night. Mm -hmm. Even now, I still cry. I dream about Cheryl. I dream about Cheryl reaching out with me with her arms and always giving me a kiss and saying, I love you, I miss you, where have you been? It's almost as if she really is coming back and saying, how come you're not here with me? One time, it was right after Christy went to the foster home, I dreamed that Cheryl came to me, well, Christy came to me, and I said, Christy, how did you find me? And she said, Cheryl brought me, and Cheryl came walking out of the shadows, and there was blood on her shirt, and I just, yeah, it was really spooky, and I said, Cheryl, I thought you were dead. She goes, no, I was faking it. I knew they were going to take Christy away and she wouldn't be able to find you, so I brought you. And then Cheryl showed us how to sneak Danny out of the hospital and everything. It was, it was a wonderful dream. It was wonderful because we were, we were the four musketeers and we were together again. And, and, but anyway, my dad knows how much I was grieving for the kids. and So he couldn't very well condemn the fact that I was having a child because it's, like I said, it's, it's not a, a full replacement. You can never replace a child. I tried to do that with Danny. Danny was a replacement for a child that I had aborted many, many years ago when I was quite young and foolish. And, and I found at that time when, when Danny was born that he is a person in himself. You, you cannot replace a child with a child. They are individuals. And this child is not to replace Cher, never. Cheryl's always going to be with me. How could I replace her? She's still here. But it's somebody to keep me company until Chris and Dan come home. Somebody that I can love and feel and talk to. It's not like you're talking to yourself anymore. There is somebody there and and that's all this is. And so my dad couldn't really condemn it even though he doesn't condone it. Over the nine months that passed without an arrest in this case, Downs lived with her parents in Springfield. Police reports claim Downs has changed her story about what happened the night of the shootings. They say she gave several different stories about the man who shot them when talking to her former husband or ex-boyfriend. Downs claimed afterward that two men were there the night of the murder, and they knew her by name. We asked her about those allegations before those police reports became public. Did you remember that there was more than one person there that night? I mean, no. long after? No. That is another thing that 
I suppose if you listen to the different tapes that were made, tapes by my ex-boyfriend, tapes by the sheriff's department, you would understand a psychological pattern that was being built up. It's something that I did not even understand at the time because, first of all, I trusted the cops. And even though I didn't trust the cops, I was forced into a position of saying they're the only people that really can help me. They're the only people that will try to find the person that did this. And you're trapped in a position of having to trust somebody even though you don't know if you should trust somebody. Downs also says the children were shot inside the car. But police reports claim high-velocity blood spatters were found on the outside of the car, on the passenger side. The police found blood on the outside of the car. Could one of the children, perhaps Cheryl, have fallen out of the car on the passenger side? The DA has come up with this idea that somebody was shot on the outside of the car, on the passenger side well, of you the were. car. I was on the driver's side of the car when I was shot. And that's why it was so, I'm going, it was planted. And, and it just seemed, I mean, it can't be real because they talk about blood spatter. And when they say spatter, I think something being shot out, like the blood spatter in the car, you know, it, it was so uniform, it was so regular, same size droplets spread evenly in a pattern. And when they say spatter, that's what I thought of. And we saw pictures of this so-called spatter. It's drops. When they took the kids, they took Chris and Cher out of the driver's side of the car, mm -hmm. and it's blood droplets. It's when they picked the kids up and carried them over the threshold, there is blood dripping down the side of the car. But May 19th is an evening that will not be forgotten by the survivors. But the, the thing that really, really haunts me the most is not even the sight and the sound. I mean, the, the sound and the smell are fading. But at night, when I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving, and the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That okay. haunts me the most. Elizabeth Diane Downs is lodged in the Lane County Jail. She's charged with murdering Cheryl Downs and attempting to murder Christy and Danny Downs.